Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, this is my presentation about how online volunteer communities can support investigative journalism. And I start by telling you just a little bit about uh, where I work. So I work at Bellingcat and we do investigative research, but a very specific, specific kind of investigative research. We are focused on what is called open source research. And that is investigative research based on openly accessible online sources. And that means we search everywhere online. So whatever we can find online, we integrate it in our work. That can be social media data. It can be satellite imagery. And most of the time, this is free to use. But sometimes we also include things for which we have to pay, right? So in our definition of what is an open source, we also include uh, satellite imagery for which we have to pay. Because in theory, everyone can access it. So we are a nonprofit organization in the Netherlands and in the US. And um, we are here for 10 years now. We have our birthday this year. And what we do is we publish investigations, right, on our website and also together with partners, with often with newsrooms and other partners. And what is also very important for us is knowledge sharing, right? So we try to um, give many workshops to teach other people how to use the same methods. And um, yeah, we, we like to share what we know because we want that more and more people use these methods. So a small definition what is open source research? So I already gave a few ideas. And um, here you see in this definition for us, research it, it is research that uses information where the journalist, which we also call researcher, and what is often called the reader or the consumer, if you like, have equal access to information sources. And this idea you uh, try, you see, I tried to represent this idea on the slide. But before I come back to this idea a little bit more, um, I would like to show you this slide, um, which is showing what type of open sources we use, right? So I already mentioned a little bit, but here you can see we often work with things like uh, maps and satellite imagery, starting with very simple things like Google Maps, but also um, paid satellite imagery. We look at various types of media reporting that is out, out there. So for instance, if we do research on a specific conflict, then there is already a lot of local media reporting. And often you see pictures and videos included in this video reporting, uh, in, in this media reporting. And that can be very helpful because our type of work is often very visual. Um, you will see just in a little bit what I mean. We also look at social media posts, right? We look at the big social media platforms that you can see here, but we are also really um, a lot into every niche platform that you can find. And of course, we also look at databases and archived materials. Everything that you can research online, we try to do it. Of course, there are also a few open sources um, or open source materials that can be a little bit more problematic. And depending on what we research, we might sometimes include them, right? Uh, remember, we do um, investigative journalism in the public interest, and journalists often um, have a little bit more rights in, in getting information and um, to do their work than, than others. But still, if these types of things are used, it needs a little bit more of ethical consideration. And that includes things like leaked materials, uh, leaks that are out there, they can often be found online already. Then um, things like uh, contact book apps. So you might know some of them. If you use these apps and an unknown number calls you, then th these apps try to tell you who's behind a number. But in return, if you use those apps, uh, usually they just take all your contact details that you have in your phone. So I wouldn't recommend using them, but they are really helpful for research. 
of course nowadays there are there are a lot of companies that also offer data about people like location data and things like that and there is also the the dark web that occasionally can also be interesting for doing research here you see an overview or not an overview so just a few examples of the type of research that we do so these are a few few examples from our website and um, you can see that um, on the left hand side you already see maps and satellite imagery and these are research cases related to conflicts but you also see other topics that you can um, do address with this a research method. So for instance, in the middle, one of my colleagues, she looked at um, something that uh, claimed to be an AI art platform, but she found that the users there, they actually generated child sexual abuse material, right? Um, I give you one um, or two examples, a bit more in detail, so that it becomes more clear. So here is a recent research by one of my colleagues, uh, Jake, and what he did is he um, looked at the recent death of um, the Hamas uh, leader, uh, Sinvar, and um, what he looked at is that the, um, the Israel Defense Forces, they shared themselves on their Telegram channel images and, and videos um, saying that uh, they show they are showing where he uh, was killed, and you see some examples on at the bottom and on the left uh, on the right hand side of the screenshot what uh, this material showed, and he looked very closely at all of this and tried to spot specific features that stood out to him and tried to find the same location on satellite imagery. And you see that um, the matches are have the same color. So the one has a red box at the bottom and you also see this at the satellite imagery. And this process of identifying a location by looking at photos or, or videos and spotting specific features and then trying to find the location and verify the location um, by using reference material like satellite imagery or maps, this is called geolocation. And this is something we do very often. Um, another example is from my colleague Iman, and uh, she looked at a case where uh, a journalist from uh, in, in Kenya, she was uh, shot in, in the thigh while being present at a protest location. So there were protests against the finance bill that, that would increase uh, taxes. And uh, she was there as a journalist. And um, then she was uh, shot from a police car. And nowadays, a lot of things are recorded, right? So also this incident was recorded and my colleague uh, found videos and photos and what you then often do as an open source researcher is you try to look at as many of uh, this material as possible and you try to make sense of it. So often we um, make a timeline of an event. So we try to find out, okay, which video was first and what happened then. So you can reconstruct what happened. And the goal is, of course, as with any type of, of investigative research is to find out, okay, um, what happened here? In, in our specific case, we often start with the question, um, where did something happen, right? Um, because that is something you can do in a good way based on photos and videos. So here in this case, uh, you see that we often try to match what we see in photos or videos to a specific location, but also, we want to find out when did something happen and, if possible, who uh, who is behind something. So just like in traditional uh, journalistic research, just with a bit different methods very often, the questions are the same. I want, nevertheless, to compare a little bit uh, what, what else um, makes our type of research different from traditional journalism. And what you see on the slide here, it's, of course, 
very simplified because uh, journalism is changing radically at the moment. There is a lot of experimentation going on. Things are changing. But in a very simplified form, you can see that traditionally, journalists had a specific task. And this specific task was to collect information and to make sense of this information. For instance, you would go out and do interviews, and this is still until today very important, of course. You would try to get access to a report, and then you uh, do research, you summarize what you found, you publish your findings, and then there is an audience, which you can see on the right-hand side, and the audience traditionally was on the receiving end of end of things. So the audience um, is the consumer and can read an article, can listen to um, a, a report, but um, they are the, on the receiving end. And what has radically changed with our type of research is that the sources based on which we work, they are not controlled by us the journalists anymore. So nowadays, since we work based on open sources, everyone has access to exactly the same open sources. And this means that we can now have an exchange between uh, the, the open sources, the journalist or the researcher who is still there, and what was in the past, the audience. And that is really, really new. And I think often we underestimate um, how, how much impact that has on, on our whole industry. And I think also on the future of what we do, because we can now completely rethink what our relationship is between journalists and newsrooms and what was in the past, the audience. And this is exactly the space we are focused on because uh, our work is really deeply embedded in online volunteer communities. So we are relatively young. We, um, we, we um, are founded in 2014 and we really have emerged rather from within volunteer communities. And that's why until now, this is a very important aspect um, of our work. So just to give a little bit of context, two years ago, I did a survey and I asked uh, people um, who, who could publicly participate, do you conduct online research for your work or in your free time? And you see a very clear divide. You see that really it's a half, half thing. Half of the people in our field who do this type of research, they, they have a job and do this as part of their job. And half of the people do this in their free time. And this is really exceptional that you have a field that uh, consists um, of, of these two different groups. And in a way that both groups really contribute, I would say, uh, equally, right? I think the numbers might have changed a little bit in the last two years because there are more and more jobs in our field. So it might have changed a bit, but, but still, there are a lot of people out there who do this type of work uh, just in their free time, which is really fascinating. And this is um, from our annual report. And here we have a nice visualization of how we as a nonprofit organization, we see ourselves embedded in a community ecosystem. So you, you can see that there are several layers. And we also have an outer layer, of course, right? And the outer layer, one could say, it uh, corresponds more and or less with um, what was the audience in the past. So these are people who read articles, who um, look at social media posts, so they they consume more. But then we have other layers of people who actively contribute, and these are research contributors. They they contribute in various ways to what we do. And um, we also have a formal volunteer community. I will talk about that more, but in this layer, we already work quite closely um, with volunteers. And of course, we also have staff members and so on. But we really have this ecosystem and we think that we are part of a big network and all of the layers are necessary. And I will talk about a few of the things we do with volunteers today. And um, I will focus on the following. So 
first of all, to understand there are two different um, ways of how people uh, volunteer for us, with us, uh, work in our network. The one is more public and more informal. These are the people we don't necessarily know, but they might answer to requests for participation via social media posts, right? Or they might be in our public Discord server. I will talk about that more in, in a bit. Or they might contribute to cr contribute to tools on, on GitHub, right? On publicly available tools. And on the other hand, we have also um, contributions um, that are a bit uh, less public and maybe a bit more formal. And this is our formal volunteer community. These are things like hackathons and um, also working with research contributors. And I will go through them right now. And um, for those of you who are maybe in the similar field or want to try it out, or even people um, uh, who, who are thinking about working with, with volunteer communities, maybe it can inspire you a little bit. So we started quite early on really to involve the public very often in our work. And this um, was specifically on Twitter for a long time. So Twitter was a very important uh, platform for us. And you can see here an example of how that often worked. So um, Bellingcat for a long time was researching the downing of the, the passenger flight um, MH17. So um, this was a shot uh, over um, Eastern Ukraine. It was a flight from, from Amsterdam to Malaysia. And um, there was a long investigation ongoing. And um, we, we were basically tracking um, on social media, public based on public sources. And, and uh, for instance, uh, this vehicle that you can see on the right hand side, just to try to find out what happened there. And um, in 2017, uh, the joint investigation team, so the, the Dutch led criminal investigation, they, they published a, a picture of the Russian Buk missile launcher that downed uh, this, um, this um, aircraft in 2014. And they had a little bit of an idea of where that photo could have been taken. So uh, they gave the name of a town, but it wasn't really clear. So what Bellingcat did is to publish or to, to share, further share this photo and to ask for tips from the community uh, to see whether someone can find out the location. And as we have seen over and over again in many different cases, um, actually, yes, the community is often able to find out the location. So here on the, um, on the right-hand side, you see a photo from exactly the same location. And um, with the help of the community, community it was then very easy to, to pinpoint to the exact location, which was in, in Donetsk at this intersection that you see here, okay? So that was traditionally our way, how we, we uh, worked in the space of, of crowdsourcing, use crowdsourcing a lot. And interestingly, there were also academic researchers who looked at our Twitter activity. So these were researchers from LMU Munich, and they looked at Bellingcat's Twitter activity from 2014 to 22. And um, they, they concluded that um, different from traditional media outlets, um, we leverage followers for information collection and verification. And hence, uh, we use a bi-directional communication on social media. And they also found that, okay, um, we actively engage with, with our audience in, in crowdsourcing information, and we don't only do self-promotion. We uh, frequently launch tweets to encourage participation. And also, um, different from traditional media outlets, um, we don't only... Um, share reports from, from ourselves, right? The self-promotion thing. Um, but yeah, we are also interested in in uh, sharing other things um, from other organizations. So that that's what the academic researchers found. Um, and I want to add that nowadays, of course, we are not mainly active on Twitter. We also have added many other channels. So one of the things we do is that we have a public discord and we have 
30,000 members on this Discord now. So that works really well. And this is a space where people who are interested in this type of research, they can join and they can discuss. Um, sometimes people ask for help, for instance, to find the location of um, a specific um, uh, uh, what photo, what can be seen on a photo and so on. So various things are going on there. So this is for us um, the, the most public space that we have because everyone can join this Discord. And sometimes there are really interesting uh, collaborations start in this Discord also between the people there and uh, other organizations. So that is uh, one thing. Mm. And we also try to involve um, people in research processes and to share with them the resources that we have. So I already mentioned at the beginning that we work with satellite imagery a lot. And satellite imagery can be used for free sometimes, but if you need satellite imagery from a specific location and you need a high resolution imagery, then it can often get quite expensive. And not many people can afford that, especially if they are volunteers, right? So luckily we have a subscription and we can even send a satellite to a specific location. We, we can basically task um, to get a specific uh, satellite image uh, from a specific location. And sometimes we involve the public and we just publicly ask, okay, where would you like to um, send the satellite and tell us why? And people make really interesting suggestions. And here's one example from just recently, we did uh, one of these. Um, and uh, one person told us to um, send uh, the satellite to North Korea to uh, some to a, a location that is believed to to be a camp, to a detention and labor camp. So um, that was one satellite imagery that was requested, and we then made this public again so that everyone can look at it, or maybe people can also do their own research based on that if they want. And um, another person requested that the satellite uh, is sent to um, Eastern, the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. And what you can see here on, on the imagery is that it shows that uh, refugee camps near a town called Goma, they have been uh, growing, they, they, yeah, they have become bigger. So the public really, people really have very interesting uh, ideas also for things that that can be researched and um, we don't pretend we know better what needs to be researched or not so we try to to um, involve people as much as we can as I mentioned earlier we also build tools um, with our community so on, on github for those of you who don't know it's it's a platform where um, where coders like to be and um, share tools and build tools and collaborate. So we also have various tools where people can just collaborate. And um, we also try to um, collaborate as much as possible, um, sometimes at least in person. So we have hackathons where we really try to invite people, either people who are interested in, in building tools for our type of research, so tools that, that really help researchers or also people that are interested in doing research. And sometimes this um, work with the community really leads to concrete tools being built. And I just give one example here. Um, one of our colleagues, he is really mainly there to uh, collaborate with the with the um, technical community. And he recently built a tool that is called a grid generator tool. It's, it's publicly available um, as most of the tools that we built. And um, this tool does the following. So I already mentioned that we do a lot of research with satellite imagery and maps. And often nowadays people also collaborate. So people might only have a vague idea where a specific pic picture might have been taken. 
And then a team of open source researchers, they try to find this location on satellite imagery. Okay, and you can imagine that if several people look on satellite imagery, it, it can get a bit chaotic very quickly because three people might look at the same spot, uh, some other spots might be ignored completely. So our colleague built a tool that lets you um, put a, 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 a simple grid on the imagery and then you can assign tasks. You can say, okay, I take the area at, at the bottom left and um, and so on so that you don't look accidentally at the same spot. You can also use it just by yourself because even yourself, if you look at a lot of satellite imagery, you, you might forget uh, where you have already looked and where you haven't looked yet. Mm. And then of course we, try to collaborate also with experts in different domains who are not journalists per se, but who uh, have a lot of knowledge in a specific area. And this we do with either our fellows, but also with external contributors who can also publish on our website. And here you see, here is a person who is a lecturer, right? And um, he built as a fellow with us uh, an amazing uh, tool that can locate active military radar systems. And um, yeah, he also published on, on our website. And I feel that this way we also have a lot of knowledge exchange, for instance, from the academic community who often doesn't publish in that way in uh, traditional media, right? It's not it's not an op-ed here. It's really uh, an in-depth uh, research and findings and so on. And we find that very valuable. So I'm a big fan of this exchange between the journalism world and the academic world, which can be a bit tricky, but it, it works with, with a bit of creativity. And then, of course, we have... Um, uh, also, on top of all of that, we have a formal volunteer community. And what that means is that we select volunteers. They, they have to apply. So we have a website and then people can just apply. And we have a community lead who um, selects these people and is really there for this specific uh, community on a daily basis. And um, yeah, people who are selected for this community, they then um, can choose to participate in specific projects. For instance, um, yeah, staff uh, like myself, we can come in in this community and we can start a project there and the volunteer community, they uh, help us. So it's really a, a co collaboration um, which, which can work very well. And I can give an example of what type of things um, are done by volunteers here. So one um, long-standing project is our civilian harm um, in Ukraine map. This is online, this map, so you can have a look at this map. And what we do here is um, we document incidents of or possible incidents of civilian harm in Ukraine. And as always, we usually look at social media, right? First of all, the first step is to identify or to find online posts that, that show something that could um, potentially be a case of civilian harm, like a building that is destroyed and so on. So the first step is, is to find these posts in, in social media and so on. And then usually we directly archive these things because things that you find on social media, they can be gone the next day. So archiving is, is very important. And we also have a, a tool for, for that. And then the next step is to find out more about what can be seen on the social media post. Can we find out the location? Can we find out the time maybe? And once this is done, it is uh, put on the map and it's an ongoing thing. So um, it really tries to, to uh, document what is going on in U Ukraine. It's of course not complete, right? Um, and also not everything is on social media. That has to be very clear. There are also things happening that are not, um, there are no pictures from it. But yeah, it's it's a project that that really um, makes a big effort into documentation, and the volunteer community puts a lot of effort and and time into that. And of course, also staff members are always involved in our volunteer projects. Right? It's never the case that um, it's just the volunteers, but there's always a staff member who who um, is there as a bridge, basically, um, and um, between the organization and the community. Okay. And sometimes 
there is also more of a um, more spontaneous collaboration. So um, researchers, open source researchers can just share a little bit about something they are working on. And then volunteers can spontaneously decide to contribute if they want to, of course. And this was the case in this publication. So um, this is a, an, an article or a research from one of our colleagues who uh, collaborated with the Latin America Center for Investigative Journalism. And they looked at TikTok accounts that um, promoted um, uh, services, people, people smuggling services, basically. So they wanted to research this topic. And one account stood out to them because it was from a person and this person was sharing a lot of pictures and the, he was hinting to being very close at least to people smuggling and um, yeah, they looked at a lot of the pictures of this account and um, it, some pictures showed himself, the person himself, uh, pretending or specifically this one here, what you see, this is a photo where he pretended to be in the US-Mexico border region, right? Um, because the, the idea was, okay, um, the person was involved in, in helping people across the US-Mexican border. And um, then our colleague looked uh, at this picture and it, it became already a bit clear that or there was an assumption that that might not be a photo from that region. And a volunteer um, of our community looked at that photo and actually found out that this has actually been taken in Florida. So it's really far away from the US-Mexican border. And that really helped uh, continue this research um, on this account. And this is the um, request that our colleague put out there um, to, to the volunteer community just to see whether someone has time to contribute. And he asked, oh, hello, everybody. I'm currently working on a case of migrant smuggling uh, into the US and um, gives a little bit of context. The following individual has posted a picture next to a river canal and is suggesting his audience to believe this uh, is uh, Rio Grande, which is obviously not. So um, it gives a bit of context. And um, based on that information, one of the volunteers quickly reacted and quickly contributed. And uh, as I said, identified the real location. And I asked her when I prepared for this talk, what motivated you to answer to this to this message? And um, she basically said the following. So she said, the main motivation, of course, is just to jump at any opportunities to put my trainings in practice, especially with a real and high impact investigation and build on more practical experience. But she also said, in addition, I was aware that the volunteers who were also geolocating the photos were very good. So I thought there was a possibility of us being successful in the task. So what I see from this, and I have seen this over and over again, is that volunteers are really motivated in, first of all, um, being involved in research that is important can have an impact, but they also want to work with other good people, right? So they also want to work with other volunteers because they want to learn from each other. It's probably not very motivating to be in a group of volunteers who are all lazy and not doing much. <laughs> That's at least my assumption. So um, it's important if you're working with volunteers in some way, I think that there are several people who are motivated in the group. I give another, another example, and this example is actually from Eigenish, um, who is also here in the chat. And Eigenish, please feel free to, to share in the chat uh, anything that comes to mind, because you know this much better. I just give a very short um, summary, but that doesn't capture the whole research. I mainly focus now on um, what the volunteer involvement was here, right? So. Um, what, what, what this research is, it's basically uh, focused on narrowing down where um, an alleged um, cartel member um, was located in a, a skyscraper in, in Dubai. 
and his partner shared um, this picture that you can see on the left hand side and Aiganish correct me in the chat at any point in time if I say something wrong. And based on this, um, it was possible to locate the exact location with the methods that you have already seen in this presentation. But what was specifically important here was to also find out the floor, the level, right? It's a skyscraper and it, it was important to find out the specific um, level, the floor number um, on which um, the person is here in this big building. And I cannot go into the detail of the method here. We don't have the time and Aiganish is anyways much better explaining this. So I recommend uh, you reading her article where she explains how exactly she did that. But what I want to point out here is that sometimes we also involve volunteers in checking our own work, which can also be very useful because here Aiganish did the work of finding out the floor number. And then there was a, someone from our volunteer community who um, also looked at the same research question and also independently confirmed the floor number, which was of course helpful, right? So you can even use volunteers in investigative research to check your own work, which um, I think is something, especially from a journalism perspective, we, we don't often think about, but it can be really, really helpful. Mm. It's also um, really working to involve volunteers in non-research work, and that is something I have been doing for a while now. So I have um, last year I had the chance to to do a fellowship, a Neiman Brockman Klein fellowship, um, here in, at Harvard. And during that time, I was really thinking a lot about tools because. For our type of work, you need a lot of tools that help you do your research that can be maps or satellites, but it can also be things like flight tracking tools or uh, various things. And I learned um, from many open source researchers, I also conducted interviews that this tool environment is very confusing for everyone because you need so many tools and you often don't know which tool to use for what. So um, it can be very confusing and there was not really a place where first of all, you can find relevant tools, but also where someone explains you how to use a tool because uh, just knowing a tool doesn't help. Uh, what is important is to learn, okay, how does the tool work? What also are its limitations in which research case should I even bother to try it out? Because in some cases, uh, it might just not be useful. So I um, used my time to, to build uh, this toolkit, which is also online. And from very early on, I also included um, our volunteer community. And what they did, so here you see uh, this toolkit and you see it has different categories for different research areas. And then if you go in a category, you see a list of tools. And if you click on one of these tool names, you come to a more detailed descriptions that shows you how does the tool work? What limitations does the tool have? Um, it links um, to, to um, tutorials for the tool. And these descriptions are written by our volunteer community. And they also maintain these descriptions because tools change so quickly. So um, nobody in the world or in our field can, can keep an overview of the tools and what is working and what isn't. And our community um, is doing that. And that has really been for me, an amazing experience also because I involved them quite early on, which means that many things were not yet defined and they helped me really define the whole project in a way that I think made it much better than I could have uh, done it alone because I only have one perspective, even though I talked with a lot of people, but um, it's a different thing um, talking to people uh, compared to really involving people in a project. So one thing that I learned from our volunteers, for instance, is that we really need to 
put more emphasis on um, reflecting on the tools we are using, right? So there are always ethical considerations with the type of work we do, because the same method you can use to do research in the public interest, you can also often use it to stalk someone, right? So we work in a really sensitive area, and that's why it's really important also to think about what tool do we use, uh, what does that mean? And it came really from our volunteers that they suggested several times that we should have a specific overview page with a reflection uh, on specific types of tools. And based on this request, we included such a page and the volunteer wrote this. And we have gotten a lot of positive feedback on this. And I wouldn't have this idea myself, right? So this shows that you can really get better if you collaborate with people with completely different perspectives. It brings you out of your um, siloed thinking often. So it can be really helpful. And the question um, now is, of course, who is volunteering in this type of online research, right, in this space and, and why? And the answer is not uh, in, in terms of who, it's not so easy to answer because we have various different people in our community. So there are people who um, have a daytime job, but after work, they want to volunteer. We have journalists who come from a traditional journalism background and want to learn this type of research. So it's we have people with a tech background who want to build tools that are actually used. So they are very diverse, but the motivation is more clear. So over the years, what, what volunteers have told me, it's always the same. So the number one reason is often that they want to contribute to research um, that that is of public interest and that can have an impact. And the thing is that in traditional journalism, there was absolutely no way for volunteers to contribute to research, right? If you don't work for either an academic institution for a newsroom or any other research institute, it's very difficult for you to, to contribute to research um, of a bigger scale. And this is what people are really ready to do in their free time because it gives them something back. It gives them the feeling, okay, I am not just a consumer and read the negative news over and over again, which makes me depressed and I can't do anything anyways against all these things that are happening. I can actually contribute by researching and finding facts and um, make a contribution. And often people are also interested in um, doing research where they live, right, in their country to, to contribute to, to create knowledge basically for the region where they are living. The other motivation is that they want to learn these skills, right? And so that they maybe can find a job in this space or maybe just to apply them to, to something they are already doing. And um, they want to join a community of people with similar interests because it is not very fun to just work completely alone. For some people, it's the right thing, but I would say for many, it's nicer if you have someone to talk to who has a similar interest to what you're doing. And based on all these experiences, I um, made here a few, a few tips, summarized a few concrete tips. If you either want to work with volunteers in the space of open source research, so everything that has to do with searching for information online, or also overall with volunteers, and um, the first thing to understand is really that the type of research we do is very new. It's a new form of investigative journalism. It, it has entered more and more newsrooms in the last few years, but we are still invest, um, experimenting with a lot of things. So a lot of things are not yet finally decided. And it has, the whole field provides a lot of potential to try out new forms of collaboration between journalists and people who do open source research and people with completely different backgrounds. And the key thing is to be creative, especially from the perspective of uh, the journalism industry. I think it's also important that we question our own role. So 
the old role of a journalist who collects information, who has the, the sole power of the information, is this still a role that makes sense nowadays? Maybe in some areas, yes, but maybe not overall. So I think by testing these types of collaborations, we can really ask ourselves what parts of our own role definition we maybe should let go and what parts we also don't want to let go. And um, what I often see, especially with journalists, is that we are afraid of collaborating with volunteers because <laughs> it's easier to collaborate with other journalists, right? We understand each other more easily, at least that's the assumption, I think, in our mind. And it, there's always the fear of losing control. But in particular, with our type of research that is based on open sources, there is really not much to lose because the sources are already public. So it is much easier to collaborate in our space than in others, because in traditional journalism, imagine you have to send a volunteer to do an interview and you have no idea has this interview taken place or not. You cannot verify it. You just don't know. You need to trust. With the open sources, it's completely different. You don't need to trust necessarily because the sources are out there. You can just double check. And that opens so many possibilities and makes it so easy. So we can experiment a bit more, uh, I think. So um, what works really very well, and you have seen it in my examples, is that um, volunteer communities can go through much more data than one person alone can do, right? So groups of volunteers are really good at collecting open sources and verifying open sources for a specific research project. So here you see a sheet that we use often that is our auto archiver where volunteers can just drop in links of social media posts that they found and it gets automatically archived so people can collaborate on, on this sheet. And geolocation, this process that I explained earlier, is also really good for a volunteer project because it's often easier to work together. These processes can be long. And if more people are involved, the chance of finding the right location is often higher. Um, as I mentioned before already, it's always it makes sense to 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 group volunteers that are interested in, in developing specific skills like geolocation or who have already specific skills or knowledge. And because it's easier to work in a group of motivated people with similar interests. And um, we also found that working with volunteers can either be done in a long-term project, like our Ukraine uh, project goes over years now already, but it can also be just a short-term thing that takes two days. Right. And as I showed, it can also be um, outside of research. It can be a toolkit, for instance. The main rule for working with volunteers is really treat volunteers as equals and not as assistants. So this is something I feel is very difficult for journalists often because I have seen a lot of projects out there that just ask volunteers to provide information like okay here I created a platform please upload information to this topic and the question is why should a volunteer do that especially nowadays they can share this on their own social media account so volunteers are not assistants that that you just use uh, and they do what you want and nothing is coming back it's it's always it's always a give and take that needs to be very clear and I think in journalism, we can learn more about that. And also projects usually need to be very clearly defined. Um, I mean, um, not always until the last step. I also shared that I involved the volunteer group really at an early stage, but um, you need to give the volunteers guidance. If that is not there, it doesn't work. Some people stop doing things at all. Others just do what they want and everyone goes in a different direction. So um, that uh, is, is not always ideal. So clear guidance and uh, defining the projects clearly. Then providing learning experiences if you can. So providing workshops, 
having staff members involved, sharing knowledge with them on how to do specific research is super important and can be super useful. Then also provide a space where the volunteers can meet and collaborate and where they can also start projects independently if they want, right? Don't try to control the volunteers too much. If they want to work on something else, do other research, why not, right? So that is one thing. And what I had to learn a lot is to be also strict. So I had to learn that if you work with a group of volunteers, you need to agree together on deadlines and commitments. And you need to be strict in letting people know that if they don't commit, they cannot be part of the community because other, otherwise this research community is not very healthy anymore. So that is what I really learned uh, this year. And that if you have people in the group who are just not active and not contributing, everyone is annoyed by this and it affects the whole group. So that should really that should really be avoided at, at any cost. And I know we don't have much uh, time left. Um, so just two last points. It's very important in such investigative research projects that staff members are really involved in some way, because otherwise you have a volunteer community that is completely detached from the journalism organization or world. And that creates a disconnect. And I think that as a volunteer, you also feel like you're not really valued. So it's really important that staff members are in some way involved with the volunteer community, even if it's not on a daily basis. And finally, um, be aware that working with volunteers also requires a lot of time. So if you are not sure whether you have the time and, and it, it requires time, then rather don't start it because the worst thing you can do is to drop a, a research project on volunteers and then to disappear. So that doesn't work. It also just needs a lot of time. Yes. And um, I will skip a little bit for those who are interested to have a few more slides. I can uh, share them with you. You can contact me um, at any point in time. And I will finish with my presentation right now. And if you have any more questions, I know some of you most likely.